Savage, and I do have a guest here by and goes by the name AJ Parr. And uh, I had come across AJ uh, through a Facebook uh, platform that I had set up uh, through guidance, and it's for near death experience interview platform um, to start inviting guests onto the YouTube channel to discuss a little bit more further about uh, near death experiences and beyond. Uh, what we call our physical reality, and to kind of do a little bit more study and research and understand it for a lot of people who aren't aware. And because we are waking up right now, you know, with this time, you know, a lot of people are asking questions and want to know more and to really kind of um, get those answers. And so I know in my own journey, you know, I've had a near death experience. Um, and so I know where I'm coming from with it. And I try to share that on the YouTube channel. And so when I came across um, AJ Parr, uh, he's been doing some research uh, as well with it, and he's had his own experience. So wanted to bring him on and you know discuss a little bit about his experience. Now, uh, his platform, um, again, he, he goes by AJ Parr, Spiritual Journalist, NDE News. That would be his YouTube channel. Yes. All right, perfect. Uh, did you want to give a little bit about your background and well first of all thank you for inviting me laura you're welcome yes uh, well basically i'm a journalist i had a an experience uh, around 30 years ago in which i woke up in the middle of the night and i was in this complete pitch dark pitch black darkness it was uh it, it was a, a place that i had already visited i remembered being there as a child in nightmares. And um, when I found myself there, I raised my hands and I tried to see the palm of my hands, but I couldn't. So I, I got scared because it was so dark. I said, wait, maybe I'm not alone. You know, it was just, just a thought. And um, since I had had uh, I had practiced lucid dreaming when I was a kid. I learned when I was around seven years old, I had a, a, a recurring nightmare. I always found myself on the top of a building. It was under construction and I was simply, I appeared in up there. And uh, when I looked down, I, I couldn't even move. I was so scared. It was like uh, I was paralyzed. So this happened over and over again. And one night when I had this nightmare, I realized I was it was I, I I realized it was the same nightmare I was having. And I realized I was actually in the nightmare, having the nightmare. That wow. means that I was dreaming. Hmm. As soon as I realized that I was dreaming and that it was a dream, I wasn't scared anymore. So I basically jumped from the building. And uh, as I fell, I said, I tried to stop falling, but I couldn't. So I, I said, well, I want to be sitting down on a sofa. And I, a sofa appeared and I was sitting there. I want to be reading a comic book. And a comic book appeared. But I continued falling and I couldn't stop it. So uh, since I couldn't stop it, I said, well, I want the sofa to bounce mm -hmm. as soon as we hit the ground. And it did. And then that day, I said, well, okay, I'm going to try to wake up. And I had to really concentrate to, to wake up. And I managed to, to do it. And that's what I did ever since then. Every time I had a nightmare, I would realize that I was dreaming. I, I would focus on, on, on waking up. And I would wake up. So I re I said, okay, this seems it could be a nightmare. Let me concentrate. And I woke up. When as soon as I woke up, I I took a a, a long uh, I uh, I took a deep breath. And I had been suffering from asthma all asthma all my life, and also I was diagnosed later. Uh, I. I or uh, sleep apnea, apnea. So I don't know if I stopped breathing or not, but this happened. 
the night, the following night, around three o'clock in the morning again, I woke up in this dark place and uh, I got scared again. I woke up and the third night it happened, it, I was really, you know, I, I couldn't understand it because three, three nights in a row. But when I was there, the three times, I felt a presence in the dark. And the third night, I discovered I was right. There was someone else there because that person spoke and it said, surrender, all is one. I don't know why, but I felt that I should trust that voice and I relaxed. And I, as soon as I relaxed, the, the you know when you're afraid you feel like an empty feeling in your chest uh, well that that sensation that i thought was being afraid grew and I, I i was relaxing and i said wow why is this why am i feeling this in my chest it's almost like being scared and it's always also comparable to when you're falling or when you're going in a car and go and you go over a bump hmm. Uh, you know that it's it's just an expansion in your chest. So I felt that expansion continue to grow, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew larger than me, larger than my house, larger than everything. I was no longer my body. I was that expansion in the darkness, and all of a sudden it kind of exploded because I appeared in the middle of a star of light. I was the star, I could see up, down, to the right, to the left, in all directions at the same time. I was one with everything. This light, it apparently uh, reached out endlessly and covered the whole universe. So it was really uh, an experience that I cannot describe. It was, I, I, I I did not see my body anymore since I could see up and down and to the right and to the left there was in the middle there was this emptiness empty empty space filled with light so and I could if I focused on each ray of light I could see each ray of light next to the other to the next ray of light and, and a small empty space surrounding each ray of light so the light was there, but it was also occupying an empty space. So I felt full and empty at the same time. This light was so intense. It was brighter than anything I've seen, but it didn't hurt my eyes. I don't, I don't, I, I didn't even have eyes, but I could see. I didn't remember being human. I uh, could hear like a, a wind or thunder it was really loud and uh, i felt overwhelmed i i felt uh, i was in bliss i felt like union with everything it call, could also be called known as love endless love endless union endless peace and also endless presence in all directions I don't know how long I stayed there, but when I got back, uh, uh, I took a deep breath and I had the fresh memory in my mind. So I grabbed my head and said, wow, what just happened? And I could not understand it, but I still felt that I was one with everything. So I looked around and I I saw myself and I saw that everything that surrounded me was also part of me. And I couldn't understand it. So I got up and I placed my hand against the wall. And I could feel my hand pressing against the wall, but I could, I could also feel the wall pressing back. But I could I was the wall also pressing back. So I was like I had like a double consciousness. I was myself or my body, but I was also everything else. So uh, I, I, I was really flipped. I really flipped out when that happened. 
And I simply, I could not go back to sleep. I, I stayed up, uh, saw the sun rise, and I felt that I was one with everything. But this faded out slowly. In two or three days, I could not feel it anymore. But in the meantime, I asked God, the universe, what had happened. Okay. So I got this download. It, it was a very short download that explained to me something that is has guided my life ever since. This was over 30 years ago. I heard, I felt the presence of a very old man near me. And he was so old, it made me cry. And I, I, I really don't know who he was, but I sort of felt he was like Adam, the first human. I, I don't know why I thought that, but he said these words. In the beginning was the one. And the one was alone, but he wanted to play. So he divided himself into two and gave number two amnesia. And thus the game began. That was it. So after that explanation, I said, wow, that means that we are one. All of us are one. But all of us at the same time are number two. We have been created from number one, which is oneness. We are made of oneness, but we have amnesia. We have forgotten our origins. And that is the only way we can exist because if we remember that we are actually oneness, we disappear. So the only way to be here is to forget that we are one. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> okay, so in reality, this is this goes way deeper because in reality, there is only one consciousness in the whole world. You and I are the same, but we have different experiences because we are, you know, no uh, two different number twos. But everything else is like each atom, each molecule. They are also part of this one mess. And everything, a plant, an animal, everything that is conscious is also part of the same consciousness. So some religions, they talk about uh, non-dual teachings and they talk about non-dual reality or and also about oneness. So uh, after that, I started, I wanted to find out what truly had happened. And I started studying different religions. I had been raised uh, as a Catholic, but I had, uh, I had already studied Buddhism and Hinduism, but I went deeper. So I joined the Gnostics, I joined the Buddhists, uh, uh, not at the same time, but in, in, during 30 years, I, I, I went through different teachings. And I, I did find that in, in all the religions, they talk about this. Also, another thing that happened after my experience is that I could take a, a sacred book, a holy book, be it the Bible or the, the Dhammapada of the Buddhists or or the Vedas, or the Upanishads. And if, even if I didn't understand most of it, I could detect when they were referring to oneness. And I can, ref when I read the Gospels, I see a lot of Jesus' words referring to this, referring to being one with the Father. He said, I am one with the Father. He also said, I am the light. I am love. And you can only reach my father through me. But he didn't refer through Jesus Christ. No, through light and love. You can only reach the father through that which he is, which is light and love. 
So I started translating in my mind everything that I was reading. And during 20 years, I continued studying. This took 30 years, but the last 10 years I started writing. So I wrote over 20 books on different religions, explaining that all the religions share the same common roots. Right. That is something that I could not discuss when I joined different religions. Uh, not, for example, a Buddhist doesn't want to know that his religion is, shares the same roots uh, than other religions and that all religions, in fact, are one. And that all religions are false, but they are true at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, religion is not the clue. What the clue is, spirituality. So after 30 years, the first 20 years, I, I only researched. The last 10 years, I, I wrote books, over 20 books. But it's, I still, I, I never found anyone who had had a similar experience. But I met, like, like four years ago, I met a Spanish journalist, a, f a female journalist who had had a near-death experience and she had a book called 20 minutes 24 minutes on the other side and she told me about her experience and when we were talking and I told her about my experience she said wow I experienced the same it was the first person in my life that told me that she had experienced the same she went to that black space and she told me that's what near-death experiencers call the void so it had a name, I said. Then she told me, yes, that she also merged with the light and that she had what they call 360 degree vision. You can see all the way around and all the way, you know, in all directions at the same time. There is no time. There is full bliss. So a lot of these characteristics were exactly what I felt. So. I then said, wow, perhaps I did have, uh, perhaps I what I had was a near-death experience, but since I did not die, maybe I stopped breathing, but I cannot prove it. So I, I always say I had a near-death-like experience because I don't want to, you know, it's not that important to, to know if I died or not, because since I cannot prove it, I better not say it. Mm -hmm. However, I decided as a journalist to start in interviewing people who had had similar experience. So uh, after a while, I created a YouTube channel where I started sharing these interviews. And um, less than a year later, I came up with what I call the nine common elements of heavenly NDEs. I decided after after interviewing a lot of people, I noted noticed that some people had had encounters with God, Jesus, or 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 heaven. So I said, okay, this this is another category within near death experiences. Let's call it heavenly NDEs. And I started focusing on heavenly NDEs. And I said, okay, there must be some common elements because I had read Raymond Moody, you know, he 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 was the, the person who coined the phrase near-death experience. And he right. was also the first person to determine that all NDEs are different, yet they share common elements. And he, point, he included 15 common elements. However, for example, the most common element is encountering the light. And this light is love, it's wisdom, it's peace. Okay. So I, I consider that this first element is highly mystical and should be included in the common elements of heavenly NDEs. However, leaving your body and seeing your body from above, that's that's not necessarily mystical. So I did not include it. Or going through a tunnel, that's not necessarily mystical. Having a life review, yes. Having a life review is transformative. It's mystical. 
meeting Jesus or angels. Yes. Uh, having the chance to return. You want to stay, you want to go back. Seeing the future, receiving a mission. So I I out I create I identified nine common elements. Some of them are not mentioned by Raymond Moody, such as hearing a voice. Uh, a lot of people hear the voice of God or they hear a voice telling them, uh, for example, some of them only hear something like, it's not your time. Mm -hmm. You must return. Right. Or uh, there are people who hear, uh, you're going to die, but you'll come back. Or I have interviewed a lot of people who have heard these types of messages. So I uh, I wrote this book, Stairway to Heaven. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this book uh, became a bestseller, an Amazon bestseller. And after that, I continued interviewing people. And I noticed after interviewing uh, Dr. Melvin Morris and Dr. PMH Atwater, they were the pioneer researchers on children's near-death experiences. So I got, I, I, I paid special attention to those people who I interviewed who had had childhood near-death experiences. There, there were not that many. But uh, as soon as I had 12, I wrote my second book, which was released more or less recently, The Girl Who Visited Heaven okay. and Other Childhood Near-Death Experiences. This book talks about the same nine el common, el common elements of heavenly NDEs, but focused on children why children? Because it is. It has been said that what people experience in, in in NDEs in general is a construct of the mind that it is the uh, the product of our spiritual beliefs, and um, and that plays an important part too. Your personal beliefs, mm -hmm. because not not everyone. Okay, we Christ, Christians or even even if we're not Christians, but if if we belong to West to the Western world, we more or less have these beliefs in the angels, Jesus, and all that. But people in India they have different beliefs, or people mm -hmm. who in a, in a Muslim society. So uh, there are in the East in which people see uh, Krishna or they see Buddha. Or they see Mohammed, or they see uh, Babaji, or or Yogananda. You know there are there are there are many expressions of the divine. Right. But I focus mainly on this in these two books on Christian and the East, and that's where I'm standing today. And right now I am analyzing other types of. Uh, in the East that are not necessarily Christian, but I continue to study heavenly in the East, and I'm planning my third book with uh, also with more heavenly in the East. That's more <laughs> or less the explanation. <laughs> awesome, very good. Yeah, well, sounds like you've been on quite a journey there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been uh, great. It's been hard. I've had my ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I did. I thanks to my channel, I have met a lot of interesting people, including you. But I also met Dr. Raymond Moody. Okay. And uh, Dr. Raymond Moody uh, agreed to write the the foreword of my latest book. Nice. And Dr. Melvin Morse, who introduced me to Dr. Raymond Moody, wrote the for foreword of my first book. And uh, I don't know, this is exciting because I've been meeting a lot of pioneer researchers. I've been meeting, I've met over a hundred near-death experiencers. Mm -hmm. And now, it's not that I stopped uh, 
uh, I stopped uh, being interested in, in comparative religion. But now I know that NDEs are the origin of all religions. Mm -hmm. Because people, not only NDEs, but STEs also, these mystical experiences stand behind the origin of all religions. Without them, we have we would have no prophets, no saints, no gurus, no no nothing. And looking back to prehistoric times, I often think that in prehistoric times where there were no books, there were no religions, the people, the near-death experiencers. When they came back, some of them had healing powers. Some of them, them could see dead people, just like modern, just like happens today. Some right. of these near-death experiencers come back with special gifts. Mm -hmm. So in prehistoric time also, and what happened? I think they became the shamans of the tribe. Before, people didn't live in cities. They lived in small tribes. And so they were the wise old man. There was always a wise old man. Mm -hmm. people, and those who had a near-death experience were the chosen ones to lead the tribe in spiritual matters. So some of them could foresee the, the future. Some of them could read auras. Some of them could, uh, I don't know. They could talk to spirits. Right. Or they could receive downloads. So that was the real origin of spirituality. Near-death experiences and all types of mystical yeah. experiences. Yeah, and then a lot of them, um, from my understanding, like the, they would too also like um, do things that would provoke, you know, the out-of-body experiences as a healer, shaman, you know, they utilize yeah, the shaman. Like peyote and things like that. Right, right. The if you if you uh, if you pay attention to the initiation rites of the shamans and also of the ancient uh, cultures like the Egypt the Egyptians, these are death and revival rites. Mm -hmm. Now the initiation is a symbolic death, and if you are giving peyote or ayahuasca or uh, magic mushrooms or any other uh, psychedelic drug that it were frequently used by the, the ancient uh, shamans, you can you can achieve an out-of-body experience. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's more or less a near-death experience. A near-death experience is basically an out-of-body experience that, with some other uh, elements. Uh, but it, I believe that they could induce these experiences. And some people say, even the scientists say, that DMT can really activate mm -hmm. your, your brain and make you experience a near-death experience, although not without having to die. You know, you actually leave your body and have this experience. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're yeah. right. No, oh. yeah. Um, now, have you um, like interviewed other people outside of the near death experience? Like maybe just generally um, out of body, or has it been more focused oh, on? Near -death I've, experience? I've interviewed. I've interviewed mediums. I've interviewed okay. uh, out of body experiencers. I've interviewed uh, shared death experiencers. Okay. So. Uh, that's another thing. Sometimes uh, when someone dies, if there's a, maybe maybe a, a family member nearby, they can actually experience the same thing that the person who, who is dying. I mean, they feel that they leave their bodies and they see the person who is dying mm -hmm. also. And they go, they go together through a tunnel. They reach the light in the end. And then they are told that they have to go back. Right. But they more or less have like a, what they call a shared death experience. 
And this okay. person, this person who has the shared death experience is not sick, is not taking drugs, is not deprived of oxygen. It's simply, for some reason, they get to experience the death of their loved ones. Not necessarily their loved ones, because I've heard of cases of nurses and doctors who have experienced the death of their patients. So this is really interesting, the shared death experiences. And also afterlife communications. Uh, there are like also like deathbed premonitions. This is when the person who is going to die is, is starts seeing their deceased relatives and start they he's there is told, look, we're gonna come get you tonight. And they actually call that night <laughs> that person dies. Oh wow. Yeah, yeah. so I I knew uh this Spanish a uh, girl who who I met the first one that told me about her experience, she worked in hospices as a voluntary. Mm -hmm. she, she, she witnessed several of these cases in which a very old lady, you know, told her, hey, she saw her, she was happy, and she asked her, hey, why, why are you so happy today? Well, my sister came in and told me she was going to take me. Is your sister alive? No, 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 she's dead. Oh, <laughs> she's uh, the other side. Yeah. And, uh, that's really strange. And, I, and, and in reality, that's what happened. She died that night. So oh. these are really strange things. There are some cases that prove to me that this is something real. This is not, not the product of imagination or a hallucination. This is something real. For example, Dr. Melvin Morse told me about a patient of his who had a, a small boy. He had he had a, a his heart stopped, and he needed to be revived. Mm -hmm. When he brought him back, he told Dr. Morse that he had been with Jesus, and that Jesus that he wanted to stay there. And that Jesus had told him that he had to go back to take care of his little brother because his little brother had a heart issue. And he told Dr. Morse, but I don't have any little brother. But then Dr. Morse found out that her mother was pregnant. And when she gave birth, several months later, she had a son and the son had heart problems. Oh, wow. So this is really strange. Another case is uh, that, that I, this this one, I, this was uh, mentioned by Jody Long from NDERF. And this this was a, 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 a man and his son. They went, they, went, they went out for dinner and they had a car accident. They were both taken to the uh, intensive care units. In, they were uh, treated separately. Mm -hmm. And the kid was taken after he was, he had surgery and all that. He was taken to his, to his, to the hospital room. And when he was there, he woke up. When he woke up, he said that he had been taken to heaven. And when he was in heaven, he also met Jesus. So he was really excited, you know. Wow, Jesus, I want to stay with you. This is amazing because everyone agrees. They say that being in heaven is delightful. It's bliss. It's, you know, you don't want to come back. Mm -hmm. They call it home. You suddenly realize you're at home. So he didn't want to come back. So Jesus told him, look. You have to go back. And he said, why? Because I made a deal with your father. My father, yes, come in. Jesus told his father to come in. And his father came and said, look, you have to go back. But I need to stay. So 
they bid farewell and the kid is all of a sudden woke up in, in his bed and he knew before the, he was told that his father had died, he already knew that his father had died. So and Raymond Moody uh, mentions in one of his books about a woman who was sleeping her her husband went out to ride his bike late at night. You know, he always took out road for half an hour and then came back home. Mm -hmm. That day he was late, so she went. She fell asleep waiting for him, and in the dream she saw him, and he had he was hurt, and she when she tried to get near to him. She said, I have to go. And when he started floating away, she started floating away with him. Oh. Uh, with him. And then he told her, no, no, you have to stay. I uh, I was murdered. I was uh, attacked. Oh. And I cannot come back. You have to please understand. And so when she woke up, she saw that her bed was empty. Her, it was already the morning, or it was oh, maybe dawn. And then someone knocked on the door, and it was the police oh announcing that they had found her husband, and that he had been stabbed, and that he died. So there are some cases mm -hmm. that tend to prove that this is actually real. Right, exactly. So I know a lot of people watch these NDE videos and say, nah, nah, boo, they're just making things up. This is not real. You know, these are crazy people or they're, they're on drugs, but nope. Mm -hmm. The good thing about believing in these, these uh, experiences is that you know you are certain that after you die, you will continue living. Right. Right. You it's lose very fear. transformative. Yes, it's very transformative. Yeah. Yeah. I know that's been my experience. Um, and with me coming back, because now that I've had the experience, part of me kind of lives from that perspective and I have the understanding, but then I have this perspective here. So I can kind of see the dynamics in that. But for me to come back and kind of like you were saying, a lot of people don't want to come back. I didn't want to come back either. And so part of me was like dreaded being here. And so it took me a while to accept that I was back here. Have you found that with a lot of your uh, interviews? Yes, uh, not only that, but I know I've met several, not 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 most of them, who have who think about suicide a lot. And uh, when I interviewed uh, PMH, Dr. PMH Atwater, she told me that that's a common symptom with kids. Kids, when they come back and, you know, they 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 want to go back there. Mm -hmm. And uh, kids are the, they suffer a lot because they don't understand what happened. They right. do not know about near-death experiences. They do not know about anything. They can be five years old, three years old, two years old. In my book, I interviewed people who had a near-death experience when they were two years old, three years old, four years old, five years old. Wow. And the, the oldest in, 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 in the book had nine years old, was nine years old. So these kids, when they are so small, they tend to, they cannot adapt to this world. They tend to be loners. They tend to be highly intelligent. And uh, they also tend to, you know, they want to go back. Mm -hmm. So some of them, uh, like 20% of them, are actually suicidal. They don't necessarily try to commit suicide, but they have it in, in their minds, you know, as an option. Right. And also, I've met two of the people who I've interviewed who who seriously think about committing suicide almost every day. Mm -hmm. But they never do it, right? Or else right. I would never talk to yeah. them. But, but, well, uh, I, 
it's it's funny because like I know like how I've what what I went through and coming back and reintegrating uh because not only are you born into this realm and then you grow up and then to have a near-death experience and then to kind of like it's almost like going back through it all over again you have to reintegrate into this um living realm right and to know what's on the other side and how it is and then to be here so I I can understand how they're suffering as if they're a child and I'm adult and I suffered, <laughs> you know, and because I didn't have anybody as a support um, that I can share and speak to about it. And so if they really don't understand, I can see how, you know, hard it is for them, you know, and then if they have the understanding that, well, I don't die, then it's easy for them to say, like, I can commit suicide. Yes. Right. There's so, another thing that PMH Atwater uh, studied or that she uh, wrote down is that adults tend to, it takes adults around seven to 10 years to understand that they had a near-death experience and to start talking about it with others. Mm -hmm. They may want to, they, they probably start sharing their experience as soon as it happens, but they learn that they better keep shut because people don't understand them or they take they say that, that you know that was a dream or you're crazy mm -hmm. so they tend to keep their experience to themselves for for 7 to 10 years i don't know if that was your case 2010 and when did you start talking about it within the last few years okay so it took yeah. you so it's about that yeah but with kids, it's from 20 to 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because when kids have their their experience, you know, they don't know, they don't know what heaven is and they don't know what, you know, uh, out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they don't have the vocabulary nor the knowledge to understand what truly happened. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, it takes them uh, longer than an adult yeah. to process the information, to understand, and to dare to start talking about it. Right, right. Yeah, and so, like, it's important for those around them to have the support, you know. For I've them. In several cases that of these childhood and uh, near-death experiencers, their own parents tell them, look, don't mention that to, to anyone. You better forget about it. It was a dream. Uh, don't, uh, sh don't, sh don't share it with anyone. Uh, they're going to uh, take you away. They're going to take you to the nut house. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't really help them, you know, to, um, to process it, you know, because oh, they no, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, like when I kind of was guided to start talking about it um, to help me, I guess, um, kind of keep me from, you know, going down because you can get depressed and you can get, you know, into those loops about being back. So they kind of guided me to, you know, doing the interviews. And then I came across uh your website actually <laughs> um, on the YouTube channel. Yours was one of that popped up, which was funny because then I you had popped up into my Facebook uh, platform, and the other one was Next Level Soul. Oh, yeah, Alex yeah, Bernard. yeah, and that has helped me to learn about you know I'm not alone in in this. You know what I mean? Right. And so it's good to hear and have that support. You know, so for sure, yeah. So I, I want to interview you uh, and learn about your NDE. How did you die? What happened? Can you say it briefly? And then I can interview you in a more uh, yeah. in well, a longer version. Yeah. So mine was, um, mine kind of goes in, and I'm glad that you kind of have the background and knowledge of the spiritual uh, religions and things like that, because you can probably understand this more than anybody else would if they haven't really done a lot of studying from different, um, you know, those belief systems like Buddhist. And so mine was actually started off with, um, you've heard of emptiness? 
No. Uh, ha, um, so emptiness, um, I had found out, uh, was from like Buddhists. Oh, teaching. emptiness. Emptiness. Oh, yes, yes. Mine started out with emptiness. And it actually led me to this deep suffering, inner suffering. And I ended up surrendering my life, basically. Oh, okay. And in doing that, I had the, the passing over. And then I had the near death, you know, the near death experience and um, my experience over there. Um, and then when I came back, um, I was instantly healed uh, from that. And but I can go in more in deep um, depth with you yeah, when I interview you. Yeah. So I, I think you'll get a lot of interesting information out of that. Uh, well, those the... those who are watching this must know that uh, this is like a two part interview. Yeah. First, uh, Laura is interviewing me, but next time I'll interview Laura. Mm -hmm. we yeah. Continue this conversation, which is really interesting. Yeah, because it's kind of been set up by the universe. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say. You know, because it's kind of uh, interesting how it all came together. Um, but yeah, so and I, I like that. Um, have you done any like? Because I know you had said you were doing some studies on the um, out of body. Did you um, like practice it after that point? After you had that uh, initial experience? Well, I I started having a involuntary out of body experiences when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. and I started having uh, lucid dreams when I was a kid. So throughout my throughout all my life, I have had. Uh, lucid dreams i still continue having them okay and uh in these dreams some of them are mystical in some of them i meet masters or i uh, receive uh warnings or advice and uh, some of them are really beautiful but i've also have had have had hellish experiences okay so most of some of them are I don't I, I cannot tell if they they are lucid dreams or out of body experiences because these two sometimes they look so they are almost the same. I also believe that dreams there are two types of dreams. The normal dream in which you remember things or you know you have absurd dreams. Mm -hmm. But those that are mystical are a gateway to the spirit world. This is different. And in the Bible and in all uh, ancient uh, scriptures, you can find that through dreams, the divinity speaks to certain prophets or disciples or even uh, uh, in the Bible, there are many prophets who are given dreams but also this they are visited by angels in dreams like joseph the father of jesus the adoptive father of jesus he was he received the visitation of an of an angel in dreams and uh, also the story of jacob in a dream he saw a ladder in which angels went up and down from heaven and so dreams are really a gateway to the spiritual world. Carl Jung, the celebrated uh, psychoanalyst, he studied mystical dreams and mystical visions. And he found that uh, behind these experiences is what he called the archetypes, mm -hmm. meaning the following, if you, for example, if you're, if you're an Eskimo who lives in Alaska, in an Alaskan tribe, and you were born 5,000 years ago, and there you are in Alaska, and you have a, an ex, a mystical experience, you will probably see an Alaskan god, and the deity will be just like they imagine. I mean, it won't be it will look like them mm -hmm. just like uh, uh, someone in in the african jungle 3000 years ago a native 
in the wild jungle, in a tribe, if he has a mystical experience or an NDE, the gods he sees will be African. Okay? Right. It's okay. only natural. Okay? So, the, this does this mean that there, there are African deities and Alaskan deities? No. Each, there is, there are, God is one for everyone. Right. But we, every one of us, has a different representation of God, Jesus, Buddha, Krishna. If you and I see, if you and I have separate NDEs and we each see Jesus, my Jesus will probably have dark hair and brown eyes. And your Jesus could be blonde and blue-eyed. So, mm -hmm. because we each interpret the divinity and practically everything in our own way. So this is what Jung called the archetypes. They, every time someone interprets or is touched by an archetype, each person will interpret it in its own way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that explains, it... oh, excuse me? Oh, go ahead. That explains why all NDEs are different, okay. yet they share the common roots. I've been learning that and in um from when I when I, and I asked in my channeling sessions because it is correct, you know, what you're saying when you do like prior to my near-death experience, I had abilities. Um, however, I cut them off because I didn't have the supports in my family. Um, and so after the near-death experience, they were kind of like blown open, right? So now I do channeling and stuff like that, but when I asked about that with the near-death experiences, you know, because everybody seems to have something different, you know, it's it came back to that's basically because of our belief systems. And, you know, if somebody believes in Jesus, they're going to be met with Jesus. If they believe in Buddha, they're going to be met with Buddha, because why would you go with somebody you don't know or believe in <laughs> to cross over to the other side? No, it, it, there, it would... there have been cases of Buddhists who see Jesus, or I interviewed a... a... A Jew, uh, a Hebrew, he was raised in the in the Hebrew tradition, and he saw Jesus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when he told his friends, they all got mad because they didn't believe in Jesus. And he started believing in Jesus. And then he started studying Sufism, Hinduism, and he started he he found out that in all religions you can find the truth. Right. But There's also all. all religions. To a certain degree, they are all false. Because if you, because why do I say they are false? Because only the direct experience with the source or with spirit or with the spiritual world or with these de deities is what's going to transform you. You will not be transformed if you only read a book's or if you only follow your religion right without any experience you know that will take you nowhere that will fill your head with norms and you know yeah. yes uh, i am this or i am that my, my religion is the only one that is true my way is the only one that leads to god only jesus leads to god they don't understand that jesus said i am light i am love and that only through light and only through love you can mm -hmm. reach God. Yeah, so it's kind of like go. It's kind of like going to like college and filling yourself up with knowledge and learning, and then not going out and have the world experience in that job. Right, right. like for example, yeah. studying to be a doctor but never practicing it. Yes, right. When when you operate, you you must do this and that, but you've never operated. So you and, don't really know. <laughs> right. So right. Then, that's that's what I call a preaching without practicing. Right. You right. know, a lot of people preach. A lot of people are professional preachers. They know the Bible by heart. And then you find out that they did this and that, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they may be the head of a small church, and then, you know, you find out that they did wrong. So you must practice what you preach. Or, better yet, don't preach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is there, do you think that there may be just um, 
a reason why certain people do have experiences um, and others don't yet? Is it maybe based on their evolution of their soul of where they are that they think, are ready? I think, like I said, uh, uh, in prehistoric times, it was natural for some people to be the leaders, the spiritual mm -hmm. leaders. And it is uh, there is a natural proportion. One out of every 10,000 people or 100, I don't know how many has this have, has these abilities. Like for example, they may they may not have had a near death experience, but you said you had certain gifts before your NDE. So these are people, people, there are people with paranormal gifts spontaneously that they develop these gifts spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And this happens to a certain percentage of people. Why? Because those are the only, those are the ones that are taking the whole world into further evolution, uh, into a, a spiritual progress. So it is necessary for some of the, some, for part of the human beings to be in touch with the spiritual world and to be, to have these abilities because it's the only way that the human race will evolve. Mm -hmm. We don't evolve due to the inventions we made and to the books that have been written. We evolve spiritually. That's the essence. Right. So uh, that's what uh, we are, our natural evolution has this huge spiritual ingredient. Because like I said before, we are all one and the same. We are right. all, we have all forgotten and we will all need to remember where we came from, from and who we are. So that's, the, the spiritual evolution is something natural. Mm -hmm. And there are these chosen people like you and like many others who have had these faculties and whose experiences are helping others understand, first of all, that death is not the end. Second of all is that you don't necessarily have to believe only in what you can see and touch. The invisible, the, the invisible world exists. There is a spiritual world. Uh, we have to become better persons, you know? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, and I can see how um, the spirituality, the, um, you know, the, the truths within the, the faults uh, of our belief systems, there's always that underlining truth. It, it is, um, um, I would say universal, it's in everything. And so when I look at everything, I can actually see uh, the spiritual truths and everything, even in like computers, because I took some courses in computers and, you know, it there's that intelligence in computers that we're actually developing now that is very similar. It's like, um, uh, like a, I don't want to say a replica, but like a, a mirror aspect of consciousness. In, in the computers. It, it's emulating human consciousness. Yes. Isn't that interesting? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it is, uh, there, there's truths in everything. And you just have to look at, you know, and not, um, I guess, uh, gravitate to like the beliefs where like you were saying, you know, my way is the only way. You know, wow. you got to look at the spiritual truths in all things, you know. You, I want to add one more thing in, in conclusion, and and that is that we think we are in the the year you know in twenty first century and that we are highly advanced, but no, we are in the pre prehistoric times compared to one thousand years from now, two thousand years from now. They will look back and say, "Ah, those who lived in the twenty first century, <laughs> they are comparable to those people who had only." Uh, Black and white movies, black and white TV, you know, the, the first radios, uh -huh. we will be we'll, we will be seen as not inferior, but as prehistoric. 
Yeah. We, we like we see the Romans. We see the okay. You talk about the Romans, the ancient Greeks, the ancient uh, uh, Egyptians. Okay. They will see us as the ancient twenty first century people. Okay. And they will see, oh, they still had wars. They still mm -hmm. had religions. They still believed in this and that. Right. They were so wrong. <laughs> so yeah. that's that's what I that's my my final conclusion is that whatever we say now, we are barely touching the tip of the ice, seeing the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can definitely see how everything um you know, we have so much more to go, you know, as an evolution for sure. But, and we've just hit the, the ice, top of the iceberg, <laughs> you know, um, from that point. It was great having you here and uh, for you sharing your experience uh, with us today. And hopefully you can join us again and we can um, maybe dive a little bit more deeper into the conversation. Um, yes, and don't forget that I want to interview you yes. so we can continue this conversation. And uh, we'll do this very soon. Okay. We'll okay. do a follow-up for sure. Yes. Uh, right. this, I, I find that uh, our conversation is quite interesting. Yeah. I, I do want to continue. Yeah, we definitely have a, a lot to kind of uncover, unpack here. It sounds like a lot of uh, inf interesting information. So. Yes. Uh, if you have any more questions or if I have, I do have some other questions, but we can do it in the follow-up uh, recording. Oh, that would be perfect. All right. Well, thank you, AJ. Uh, thank you, uh, Laura. It was my pleasure. All right. Have a great day. You too.